race is on. And Max Verstappen dug himself out of the gravel and overcame an unreliable DRS to win the Spanish Grand Prix. But only after Charles Leclerc retired from the lead and teammate Sergio Perez let him past. But would Ferrari have won without Leclerc's problem? And is Mercedes now back in the fight? I'm Ed Straw and joining me to answer those questions and many more are Scott Mitchell and Mark Hughes. Scott, how's life with you? All good, all good, thank you. Uh, this was a race that I followed remotely, uh, one of the ones that I, I got to miss, um, which uh, probably turned out to be a, a, a mistake from my point of view because it's quite a, quite a dramatic race in a, in a few ways. Lots of stories going on um, off track as well as a decent race on it. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure it was uh, pretty, good from, uh, pretty good from where you were sitting inside the media centre, but it wasn't too bad to follow, follow along from home. What do you think, Mark? Do you think Scott deserved to share in the traffic jams and the, the chaos the events seem to be embroiled in? I think he would have enjoyed it. Um, you know, I think uh, there's, enough, there's enough going on around the paddock for Scott to get his teeth into, but um, I am sure even even at a distance he'll, uh, he'll make something from it. He's quite an imaginative sort of lad, isn't he? So, yeah, I, th- I think um, he'll, he'll be all right, but I'm sure he would have enjoyed it if he'd, if he'd come along. Yeah, well, it's always good to be on the ground, and obviously that explains why I haven't seen Scott all weekend. So, uh, so now I know you just had it. You, you didn't even know I wasn't on site. What an impression I usually make. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That was pretty much it. I just thought you were sat somewhere to my left and uh, just quietly just in your uh, blind getting spot on with all it. Weekend. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I do have a very large blind spot for many things, so uh, it's always very possible. Um, as always in this podcast, we'll discuss. Pretty much all the big stories from the race, Leclerc's disaster, Verstappen's recovery, the revival of Mercedes, and of course, the Aston Martin upgrade philosophy. But first, Mark, we've got to ask the standard question of how the race was won. Leclerc started on pole position with Max Verstappen second. So can you take us through how it all played out? It first, for the first few laps, it was a continuation of the um, Leclerc versus Verstappen battle we've seen all season and uh, it was too close to call. Leclerc was leading from pole. Verstappen was in his mirrors, but not in DRS reach. But it was early, early days. You wouldn't have expected him to um, to have been pushing at that the, that stage because of the the very high tire deg in the um, very high energy circuit on a very hot day. Uh, it was it was going to be a tire management race. So that was, it was going to be fascinating to see how that was going to play out because on the Friday. The Red Bull had looked easily the best um, in in that regard on the long runs. Um, the Ferrari about half a second a lap on average off, um, but on Saturday they did a pretty wholesale setup change and uh, rearranged their uh, strategy plan. And actually they did a very very all well, Claire did a very very respectable long run on Saturday morning in FP3, and that sort of made everybody sort of reassess, think, oh, um, yeah, it could be very close. So, uh, yeah, we were just looking forward to seeing how that was going to play out. And then um, Verstappen went off through the gravel and lost two places and about 10 seconds by the time he eventually sort of got his way. So at that stage, uh, Leclerc got the race won. So, um, yeah, Verstappen, had, Verstappen at that point had blown his chance of victory. Um, but uh, it subsequently came back to, of course, through uh, Leclerc's power unit failure. And of course, blown his chance of victory. That's appropriate because the wind was given some of the credit for this uh, this off, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very gusty there all weekend. Turn uh, five, turn turn four, five, and nine were the problem corners where you got a crosswind. And, uh, yeah, there was a particularly big gust of wind on, on that occasion. And um, a couple of laps earlier when Carlos Sainz had gone off at the same place. And, yeah, it was uh, it was a feature of the weekend, really, this very strong crosswind. But I think um, also what played into it was the uh, the balance of the cars and the way that the tyres uh, were degrading um, – was catching the teams out, and it was the, the the cars were much more tail happy than I think um, they they were they were expecting. And uh, as as the stint went on, they became more so as the uh, as the rears took a bit of a, a hammering. 
Well, as always in this episode, we have members of the Race Members Club asking questions about the race. The Race Members Club offers various bonus content, including the chance to ask us questions in our post-race podcast. Head to therace.com and don't forget the hyphen and click on the Join the Race to find out more. And Mark, you pretty much just answered uh, one of the questions we were going to answer now from Chris Parrott, which was saying it was unusual to see two front runners make the same mistake and about the wind and unusually susceptible. But Scott, I was going to throw that to you. It was surprising to see not just drivers going off there, but two top drivers going off within a few laps of each other. I think when we saw signs go off, it was a bit of a, oh my God, how is this? Uh, how has this happened? You know, what's going wrong for Carlos at the moment? And this this uh, podcast basically features a now pretty standard trip to Carlos Sign Sympathy Corner, doesn't it? Because he is um, he is really struggling in that Ferrari, so it felt a little bit like. That was just an isolated incident in, an, and an extension of Sainz's issues with the Ferrari. But then we saw Verstappen go off there. And I was racking my brains when that happened because Max is far from a perfect driver and we've seen him make different kinds of errors this year, last year, whenever. But I was really struggling to think of the last time he made an unforced error on his own in a Grand Prix. To, to to this degree. And that that's what was weird to me. I mean, wh- when was the last Max mistake? Can I have a review think of when it was when he just went off on his own in a race? <laughs> Stony silence. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to, to bring it to mind. I'm sure it's happened. He had that spin at Brazil in the wet, but that was about five years ago. That one uh, that one's brought to mind. Yeah, and, he, and, he, and he, he was about 12 when that happened as well. So I don't really think we can, um, we can really count that. So yeah, I think it was... Uh, the, I think the wind just caught drivers out. We, we we know that Formula One cars in general were just very sensitive to to the wind, and I think it was quite. I think it was particularly gusty um, at times today, and I guess when it happens so suddenly as well, you can just see like the car just goes, and the drivers they don't, don't have a hope. Our second question, which I'll aim at Mark, is from Matt Ridley, which is: Was Verstappen's pace on the three stop strategy likely enough to rein in Leclerc had he continued? So, a good alternative reality question: How would that battle have played out had the Ferrari still been there? There was no real indication at that stage whether the three stop or the two stop was going to be better. Um, I think, on balance, the two stop was better. Um, and although Perez um, believed that uh, Verstappen's three stop was a better strategy than his, t- what was nominally two stop, which became a three stop just because it was free later on, um, actually, it, it, I don't think it was. It's a, it, it reminded me a little bit of um, the 2009 race here and the battle between the brawns of Jensen Button and Rubens Barrichello, where Jensen used a, in theory, slower three-stop strategy to beat Rubens on a two-stop. Um, it was a little bit like that with uh, Perez compromised a little bit. So I think the, I don't think the three-stop, a three-stop Red Bull could have beaten a two-stop Ferrari that already had track position over it. I think the only way the Red Bull could have beaten, had a chance of beating the Ferrari, would have been on an on a equal strategy. Well, let's move on to Perez now, Scott. As the keeper of Sympathy Corner, you're best placed to adjudicate on whether Sergio Perez belongs there for having to cede position to Max Verstappen. Actually, he had to do it a couple of times in the race, didn't he? The radio comms reference different strategies. It's clearly a, a team order that the uh, on both occasions, the second one being the, the significant one. Perez did call it unfair over the radio, but did say he'd comply. Was it unfair in any way? I think he has grounds to feel aggrieved it- to to a to a certain extent, but not not. I don't feel like Red Bull cost him the win or or, or anything like that. Apart from the fact that Perez just didn't ultimately end up on the fastest strategy, but even he sort of suggested afterwards that wasn't really like him being stitched up. It was just them splitting the strategies because they weren't sure what would ultimately work out the fastest. And Perez needed to be on Verstappen's exact strategy to win that race. He he said that himself. I think where he where he probably was right to think it was unfair was the um, the point of the race where Verstappen was stuck behind Russell, and all per- and Perez just wanted to be let through so that he could crack on. And he probably thinks he could have gained a few seconds in race time doing that. Whether that would have won in the race or not, I think it's a bit too much of a stretch to claim that. 
So I don't really feel like Perez lost anything. There was just obviously an unnecessary amount of tension and a bit of needle within the team because Perez felt that he'd been unfairly treated as the number two. And it's interesting, to me, what's most interesting is not really whether Perez had a case or not because drivers always think that they've got the wrong end of the stick. But it's interesting that he's actually sort of pushed back on it because we kind of all think that Perez is just going to be there as the happy subservient driver because he's just got a great career opportunity he's getting an extended spell in Formula 1 he's earning good money he'll be scoring podiums maybe every now and again he'll be allowed to win a race but what happened today sort of suggests actually he's not really that happy in that role if he thinks he's genuinely the faster driver or going to have the faster race is he? Yeah ultimately drivers don't really like being in that situation Christian Warner did say it would probably be a bad thing if Perez wasn't a tiny little a bit irritated about it I thought the team orders were were fine. I've I've not got such a big problem with team orders in Formula One. Verstappen is going to be their title shot, even though Perez has had a good start to the season. That's just a, a fact, and Perez knows that. And I don't mind Perez just saying, "Well, I think it's a bit unfair, but I'll do it." I- Got no problem with that at all. We don't know exactly what he's been told in the past about what will and will not be allowed. But certainly from my perspective, when I was watching those situations unfold, there was never any doubt in my mind what was going to happen. No, I completely agree. Um, I, I, I did. The only thing I, I would say is I did think at one point that when Verstappen was coming back up at Perez after he'd gone off, I just assumed that because Perez was tucked up behind Russell and you know getting quite close to making a move that he would um, he would be allowed to stay there. So when they swapped positions there, I kind of thought, oh, that's uh, it's just, just a bit needless at this stage, you know? It's always going to happen and there's, there's, there's always going to be a little bit of uh, criticism for it and dissatisfaction and that kind of thing. But uh, team orders are, uh, are ultimately here to stay and it made the race more straightforward for Red Bull. They got a 1-2, both drivers did their job, team did their job, job done and Perez still continuing to do the job that he's there to do and probably inching himself another step towards that 2023 contract. We should talk a little bit about Ferrari's problems though, Scott. What do we know about the problem that cost Charles Leclerc victory? Very little uh, beyond the fact that it was obviously a very serious problem and it was also a very sudden problem. They didn't have any prior warning of the failure, whatever it was. Um, the first they knew about it was when Leclerc radioed the team to say that he was in trouble. So the engine, as we speak, is probably on its way back to Maranello. Um, it's going to be stripped. The, everything's going to be stripped down to 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 to, to check it. Um, the only thing I would say, uh, this is a little bit of sort of guessing a little bit, but it's obviously fairly high mileage at this point. This was the sixth race weekend of the season. There, there are three um, of each major part that can be used over a season. So free internal combustion engines, free MGUH, etc. So they all have to do about seven or eight events that give or take if you want to do a season about a penalty. Um, so for it to fail early on in the sixth Grand Prix in some way is potentially very concerning uh, for Ferrari. We know that they've got a heavily revised combustion engine for, for, for this year. So whether it's linked to that or not remains to be seen. Maybe it'll be some silly one euro part that's failed or, or, or something. I would imagine we'll have an answer before Monaco because Ferrari's actually quite good at giving proper updates on this sort of thing once they've actually diagnosed a, a problem they might not necessarily go into a huge amount of um, specifics on it but I think they will actually diagnose an exact cause and, and, and inform us so I suspect we'll know before Monaco where Ferrari won't want to do an engine change because Monaco is quite a good one isn't it Ed if you've got a high mileage engine that's maybe sort of lost a little bit on power or anything like that it's like it's not really a place where you gain anything by introducing a fresh one. So you want to kind of get through Monaco without having to, to, to switch engines if you're Ferrari, I suppose. Yeah, that's what the teams will ideally be aiming to do. And it's a low mileage weekend as well. It's the one Grand Prix that's actually shorter in terms of distance because of how slow the, the track is. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Six point lead now Max Verstappen has in the Drivers' Championship over Leclerc. So that's a, that's a big blow for, for Ferrari. Yeah, on the championship swing, I think it's significant because... Ferrari obviously got into a really strong position early in the year by having a quick car and just getting the job done while Red Bull was unreliable and having messy weekends. But actually, 
that was the first three races of the season and the second three races of the season it's all swung towards Red Bull and Red Bull still aren't perfect they're still having really messy weekends the DRS problem for Verstappen following a weekend in Miami where again he won but was unhappy that, that things just weren't really that neat and tidy he keeps calling well in Miami he called Red Bull hit and miss and that's exactly what they were again here they were lucky to come away from this but while they're trying to sort all this stuff out, they now do that with the luxury of a points lead. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago where Verstappen was, what, 46 points or something behind Leclerc, now six-point lead, and Ferrari's now staring at a deficit in the Constructors' Championship, having led Red Bull relatively comfortably only a couple of races ago. So reliability is key in a title fight, and I think in this, this Grand Prix we've seen an instant example of just how damaging bad reliability can be. We should also note that obviously there are updates for Ferrari. We were looking forward to that going into this weekend. A new floor, the main attraction there. A few little detail changes on the car, including the the inside rear brake fairing that's all important. We're seeing lots of changes on all sorts of cars there and a new rear wing they had as well. Seemed to be working pretty well. Ferrari reckoned it was reducing their porpoising, therefore allowing them to run a little bit lower which is very, very encouraging for them, and it validated their longer-term development path. So that's encouraging. Smaller few bits and pieces on the the Red Bull, but still good to see Ferrari and Red Bull up there kicking lumps out of each other. So that's that's quite encouraging, and now Mercedes inching their way up. One thing we did need to talk about is Carlos Sainz, Scott. He had that trip through the gravel that we've we've talked about. Chris Parrott from the Race Members Club says, did Sainz's race help or hinder his championship challenge? I guess that's referencing the Leclerc gap specifically. Yeah, obviously it's mathematically helped it because he's cut the gap to Leclerc. So I guess within the team, um, it's going to look a little bit better from that point of view, smaller points gap. But obviously Verstappen's now the new points leader and he would have extended his margin over Sainz um from the from the from the previous race plus I, ju- I just think with the manner of the performance signs isn't um he's not exactly making himself look like uh anything other than a number two driver at the moment is he and, and i feel for him I'm, I'm not saying that to insult him or anything like that but you know i touched on it earlier there just seems to be one thing after another at the moment i can't remember seeing one driver spin so much you kind of now feel a little bit bad for the amount of times we used to mock Sebastian Vettel spinning a Ferrari. That just appears to be what drivers who aren't Charles Leclerc do in a Ferrari these days. Um, it's just difficult for Sainz. And you can see it's taken a toll on him because he says you know, he's, he's facing a challenge he hasn't had in his career before. He says he's having to think and drive outside of the box and that sort of unnatural driving style is breeding mistakes. So if any, I think he might be a little bit lost at the moment in terms of what this car needs and what he can do to get on top of it because it's just not gelling and we're six races in now and there there isn't really much sign of improvement, is there? I mean, the pace is fine. Like that's not the problem. It's just it just feels like he's always quite close to an error. Yeah, it's very frustrating for him. It, it's rear end instability, as he said, the rear end getting a bit light that's causing problems for him. It's not doing it all the time, but there just seems to be a little characteristic that it quite often goes. Leclerc is brilliant at catching these moments. Science isn't so keen on them. Remember that Renault season he had, the full season alongside Nico Hülkenberg, where Hülkenberg did outperform him over the year. That was because Science was limited by that rear end instability. So this is a, a thing that's quite tricky for him. But the thing that will really sting for Science is if you said to him, just before the race, just went out to on the grid and say, hey, Carlos, you know what's going to happen here? Your teammate's going to have an engine failure and Max Verstappen's going to pile through the gravel and lose a load of time. He'd be thinking, well, that means a win for Carlos Sainz, surely. And he's ended up in fourth place, which will just have, have rubbed salt into the wind. He's a classy driver and he's going to have some, some good races this year. I'm still sure he'll win a race this year, but it's got to be tough for him at the moment. Well, it, obviously, if circumstances had not... Been, if circumstances had been a little bit different at the end of the race, he'd have finished fifth behind both Mercedes, wouldn't he? Um, he got he got he got lucky that Lewis Hamilton went into sort of limp mode basically the last few laps just to get to the finish, um, and that allowed Signs back up into fourth. But he was still bested by the Mercedes of George Russell. Could you imagine saying that one two races ago that one of the Ferraris would would be lucky to to to, to beat a Mercedes? Yeah, and he could easily have finished behind Valtteri Bottas and the Alfa Romeo as well, who had that two-stop that didn't quite work out for him. So yeah, difficult day for for poor old Carlos Sainz. But did it help or hinder his championship challenge? I'm going to say hinder overall, because it's just like you said, Scott, it's it's cast him as the, as the number two. 
Well, one for Mark now, who has been quiet for a bit, which is for a reason, because we've been having some internet problems with him. He's not in the same hotel as me, so he's been a little bit uh, in and out, shall we say, but we, we have got him for a moment. So let's talk Mercedes, Mark. After his collision with Kevin Magnussen at Turn 4 on the opening lap, Hamilton emerged from the pits 54 seconds off the lead. He suspected damage, he even did suggest retiring the car to save the engine, but he finished fifth, the same margin off the lead after backing off with a late problem and reckoned he could have taken the fight to Red Bull with a clean race. So could he? Yes, he could. Um, he could have taken the fight to Perez, um, not, not to Verstappen, I don't think, but um, they didn't have the pace for that. But yeah, basically Hamilton had a slightly different setup to um, George Russell, uh, one which made the park car a bit more uh, unmanageable over a single lap, but was uh, much better for tire deg in the race and he had much better race pace than George and had he not had that what ended up as a 45 second time loss with the um the incident and the slow drive back to the pits on a punctured tire and a pit stop um had it had it not been for that then uh, yes, he would. Uh, Mercedes would have had to move George out of the way in order for Lewis to go and attack Perez uh, later in the race. And uh, yeah, every given given the straight line speed that he had, I think um, perfectly feasible he could have at least engaged Perez in battle for second place. Um, he had uh, really really strong race pace. Uh, Comparable when you do the offset for the tyres and the fuel, um, comparable with uh, that of Leclerc, but with the proviso, Leclerc was um, not needing to push. You had a you know a comfortable lead. So uh, yeah, I think um, Mercedes have got every um, reason to be very happy with uh, with the performance of uh, both the drivers. Uh, slightly. Slightly different patterns. George is um, shining on qualifying and do, doing some very feisty race moves, of course. But um, on raw race pace on on the day, uh, Lewis had um, the upper hand. Yeah, Hamilton looking a lot happier, wasn't he, though, Scott? It wasn't just the way he was driving in the race, but also the kind of messaging's changed from him suddenly, hasn't it? Yes, there's been a complete tonal shift over the course of the Grand Prix. Um, Within the weekend, uh, there, there were obviously uh, more positive noises from Mercedes overall. But within that, because Hamilton did acknowledge the fact that the, the car was improved on Friday and Saturday, but because he was lacking something compared to Russell, he admitted he was finding it difficult. Um, and he's actually said in a couple of different points this weekend that he's found it difficult for a while and it's the first time I've got much of an impression from him that maybe there is actually a little bit of a hangover from what happened in Abu Dhabi last year I still don't think it's right to question his motivation or anything like that I just think when it's been so difficult for him in the early races I just feel like that maybe if there is that little bit of a cloud from how last year ended that it's just not as easy to shake it off and go again. That doesn't mean that he's sort of questioning his commitment or anything like that. It's just naturally that there's a maybe a little bit of a lag in terms of sort of what he wants to do and then sort of what his mind is sort of being actually sort of compatible with. Um, but the, the the performances haven't haven't really dropped. I think there are just these moments where he sort of seems a bit downcast, which is completely valid considering what he went through at the end of last year and the way the season started it's obviously so far below expectations so so that was the sort of situation going into the race Hamilton was a little bit flatter than the other people in Mercedes but still very much acknowledging the the upward trend that they seem to be on and then obviously he got kicked yet again at the start of the race another another blow to his morale because he had that first lap incident with with Magnussen which I didn't really think it was Hamilton's fault at all. Um, I and mean, you got that me- radio message where he basically just wants to jack it in. He's It's just, you know, let's save the car. It's, this is pointless, basically. And he had to be sort of perked up and cajoled into continuing. He's like, no, come on, Lewis. We reckon we're going to score points in this. And then by the end of the Grand Prix, Lewis is t- 
tone was totally different. He was absolutely chuffed with the race. The race pace was obviously really, really strong. Um, the result was good, even though he had that late um, that late setback. And then after the race, he was so upbeat and so looking forward to the coming events. And it just feels like that. It just it just feels like now outwardly Hamilton is on a par with I think how he has been in the car. I do think he has still been at a very good Lewis Hamilton level in the car. I just think people have maybe sort of read a little bit too much into some slightly slumped body language. But then after the race, I really feel like that body language changed. So I, I think I think there is I think there is an extra element of motivation around Hamilton. Not to say he was unmotivated before, but just a little bit more sort of pep and a little bit more vigor around him. And I think that will only that will only help him, obviously, as Mercedes looks to get uh, looks to get his season on track. Yeah, it's the season starts here, really, for the Mercedes drivers. In fact, George Russell said something along those lines in the post race press conference after he finished third. But from Lewis Hamilton's perspective, he seems to uh, have that fire. Crucially, the Mercedes is working reasonably well. That's the really positive thing. It's porpoising a little bit still in the corners. It's largely eliminated on the straights. That says to me, not just is the car working better, but Mercedes have understood the problem. That was always the key question we were waiting to have answered. They have understood it. So now they can just start what you might call normal development. There's presumably still a little bit of work to do on finessing it, but that's very, very encouraging for them. Speaking of George Russell, he finished third, but he was ahead of both Red Bulls at one stage. Obviously, he was happy with the upgrade package. So do you think that this has proved... Mercedes is now on top of the problem and that it's got as well two drivers who can be up there challenging for race wins in in Hamilton and Russell. I think it's a validation of the concept that they've got. Um, I think it's a little bit difficult to say that they absolutely 100% understand things purely because there was a suggestion they've had to take a little bit of downforce off the car to get it to work the way it was working now. So I still have that little reservation of what happens when they try and put more downforce on? Because obviously they're going to have to because they're, they're lacking performance. What what they've done is Russell said that they basically halve the gap to the front, but there is still a gap remaining because while Mercedes have been focused on fixing their car, all the others have been focused on improving it and, and actually adding performance. So Mercedes presumably needs to add more downforce. The question is when they add that downforce, is that just going to trigger the porpoising again? If it doesn't, that means they've understood it and they've found ways mechanically around it or they've changed the way they produce downforce to do it in a way that doesn't in, in, in invoke the porpoising effect as ba- as badly as we've seen it so far. So I think that's that's the key first part. But as for the drivers, that's not something I've needed to 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 wait for an answer for this season the the only question mark over Mercedes at the start of the year was is the car ever going to get good enough to win a race I've been convinced from the start that Russell would be able to 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 do that we know that Hamilton's able to do that and I I, I don't have any questions about the the level Hamilton's performing to and and Russell just showed in this rock Grand Prix that he he's so up for the fight and he's capable of going sh- you know going wheel to wheel with the best of them. To take on Verstappen the way he did and just be really aggressive and just not be bullied, I thought was fantastic. I, I, I did think that Russell was a bit unfair through turn three. I, Russell said afterwards he left. He, you know the rules say you leave a car's width, and that's what he did. He didn't leave a car's width. There wasn't quite a car's width there, but there's enough room on the outside there, and it's fast enough, and there's enough grip that I just think you kind of let it go in, in, in that in that situation. It was hard racing. I think it was just about fair. Verstappen even said afterwards that while he found it annoying at the time, he looks back on it quite fondly. I, it's easy for him to say that because he obviously went on to win the race. So maybe his opinion would be different if he finished behind Russell. Of course, Verstappen was quite frustrated with the whole DRS situation as well. There we should mention that Red Bull weren't completely sure what it was, but Christian Horner did say after the race that... It was potentially a consequence of them being a little bit too aggressive with the weight saving on the the DRS actuator and assembly. So perhaps it's just a little bit too flexible and susceptible to curb impacts and that kind of thing. And Verstappen said he tried everything to to try and stop it 
having problems, use curve, stay off the curve, hit the button 50 times, hit it once, and just, it was just intermittent. Sometimes it was there, sometimes it was not. So that's something that Red Bull will need to be looking at. And of course, they've been very aggressive in trying to get the weight down of that car. So you, you can see how they get into that sort of situation. Let's talk about Alfa Romeo now and Valtteri Bottas, Marcus faded back into our into our, our podcast. He's very, very intermittent as well. We might try and get a few more answers out of him. Valtteri Bottas got that sixth place in the upgraded alpha. So can you explain why he actually wasn't entirely happy with that result? Yeah, Valtteri um, had a, another impressive race. He was clearly best of the rest after the big three teams and uh, he finished in that position and may have even, you know, um, done gone one one place better um he was disappointed with the team's strategy he felt that they um pitted him too early and that he could have defended and done a, a longer uh subsequent stint and uh, kept kept track position in that way but uh you know to be disappointed with that sort of result shows the progress that that team is making but it has regularly seemed to be the best of the rest in, in recent races and uh, even though they weren't entirely satisfied that the upgrade give them everything that uh, simulation had promised e- even with that they with, they still pulled this sort of result out of the bag and that sort of qualifying performance and so I think um, as I said I think in the last podcast that car I expect that car to really be very very strong around Monaco uh, this coming weekend and um, I yeah, I, I'm quite uh, intrigued to see what Valtteri can do with it there. I was just thinking back to my interview with Valtteri in Melbourne. And I sat down to him, sat down with him one to one, and we talked about whether you know a podium was realistic, and sort of you just had to be there and be the best of the rest on the day that a bit of drama happens. And obviously, Leclerc had retired, Verstappen's had a spin, Sainz has dropped himself into the pack a little bit, and it's like I. Oh, wonder if this will be the day and i have to have to admit while um don't end up sort of rooting for any real specific situations through the course of the year i think a valtteri bottas alfa romeo podium would be one that i just really enjoy just personally professionally whatever you want however you want to call it i I don't see how you can not like that result if that if that comes and i I briefly did wonder if we were going to get that today yeah well if they keep doing what they're doing alfa could well pick something up later in the season there's no doubt about that bottas is driving very well Next race, next race. Let, Bottas is so excited about Monaco because uh, the Alpha, he feels the Alpha's really strong low speed. So it'd be really interesting to see how he goes there. It could be one of those things where he's built it up so much in his head, he gets there and he's knocked out in Q2. <laughs> yeah, or his wheel gets stuck on at a pit stop or some ludicrous piece of yeah, bad Yeah, three-day pit stop. Yeah, exactly. But another team, Alpine Scott, they had a difficult time in qualifying. Ocon was 12th. Alonso was eliminated in Q1. So he took a new power unit and then came from the back to finish ninth, two places behind Ocon. Alpine's the great yo-yo team of F1, isn't it? And yeah, Saturday to Sunday couldn't have been much more different for them. So what did this weekend tell us about that team's development trajectory? Uh, <laughs> I really, really don't think it showed much about this team that we uh, we hadn't already seen so far in that it's got a very good car when the car's working well it's fourth or fifth quickest but they just seem they just seem completely incapable of threading together a complete a complete um a complete weekend sometimes they've had a stronger quality car than a race car um the expectation this weekend was to have a stronger race car after qualifying um so this was the first time that actually the qualifying was, was, was sort of like the week the week apart in terms of actual outright performance, they've obviously just had elements of execution that have compromised them in qualifying at previous races. So, yeah, I, I just, I didn't really feel like, I, I, I just don't really feel like Alpine changed at all this weekend, which I, I guess, to answer your question, probably shows that the development's fine because they didn't have like a, they didn't have a massive package this weekend. I think they had a mix of sort of refinements and detail work plus some circuit specific stuff with uh, with, the, with the new rear wing so yeah i it kept them pretty much where they were before i it was sort of no more or less than that Do you know what i mean it was it, it, it was fine i guess that's encouraging because in the past we've seen that this team's not been particularly mega with aerodynamic development has it so maybe it's still part of this 
theme of the season, which is yeah, actually that team's looking quietly encouraging, but it still doesn't really have the results to show for it. <laughs> Yeah, and the race pace was genuinely good. Esteban Ocon was actually quite surprised by how much he was motoring up the order early on. And the pace was quick throughout for him. And the pace was strong for Alonso too. He'd said effectively they'd sacrificed the weekend by taking that power unit. Instantly, that extra power unit in the pool, the team now says if everything goes as expected, which is a big thing to say with so many races left, he should be able to get through the campaign without uh, without any further further penalty so that was a kind of strategic change given he was well down the grid but they felt that Alonso could come to the points from there Alonso called it a bit of a victory because he indicated they he pretty much given up on points there so yeah that's encouraging that you had one car starting sort of just outside the top 10 and and making progress and getting into the point straight away and then Alonso executing a, a, a good race. Question from the Race Members Club member Oscar Robledo, who's always sending questions in for this podcast, which is much appreciated. Do Alonso's performances prove that hunger can overcome age? Uh, I don't think Fernando will appreciate the question because how many times have we heard since he arranged for this comeback that age isn't a factor and he doesn't know why people obsess about his age I, I've, I've always wanted to just respond to that with Fernando there's a reason everyone obsesses about your age because you're the oldest driver on the grid by some margin now so it's perfectly valid for people to focus on the age of the oldest driver in, in, in Formula 1 especially given the performance of other drivers who have reached that age in recent years but I think I, I just think Fernando's been a, a very consistent level um, I was surprised in Miami how scruffy that race was that that felt a little bit out of character there were elements to it that were still at Alonso's normal standard but others that were just quite clumsy um which was a little bit different um but this one just seemed like <laughs> I felt like he'd created a good situation for himself after qualifying where he basically just like oh, it's a write-off you can't do anything around this track unless you get really really lucky so unless I get really, really lucky, it's not my fault if I don't go anywhere tomorrow. That seemed to be the sort of message after qualifying. And then obviously anything he does beyond that makes himself look like a hero. Alonso is very, very good at that sort of self-PR game. Um, but it was a very good drive. Um, th there were opportunities in that race with the way it played out. It was quite chaotic in terms of knowing exactly how many pit stops to make and what tyres to use and when. Plus, obviously, a couple of big cars dropped out. So, um, yeah, it... it, it it was just it was just Alonso doing what he does best, isn't it? Being an absolute hero in really, really adverse conditions, doing something that no one else could have done with that level of machinery. Is that about right, Ed? In the in the ballpark. I mean, it was certainly a very good performance from from Alonso, and he's not afraid of talking up his his performances. They don't really need talking up. The question was, do his performances prove that hunger can overcome age? Well, normally age can overcome the hunger and the desire, but that's the thing with Alonso. That desire is still there. And there will come a point where that can't defeat age, but I, there's nothing in what he's doing to say that that age is costing him much sharpness or anything. And he's dead keen, as far as I can tell, to get a new contract for next year. So yeah, things are still going well there. Let's move on to McLaren now. And I should confirm for everyone that we've pretty much given up on Mark Hughes now because he's had all sorts of problems. He's been battling valiantly to uh, join this podcast, but we've just had a few moments. And unfortunately, the uh, the, the, the Spanish internet has, has let him down. But we're going to press on nonetheless. So McLaren, Scott, mixed race. Lando Norris was eighth. Daniel Ricciardo was completely baffled by the lack of pace down in 12th place. Norris also had tonsillitis, so it was not in a good way. And, and he really did look unwell. That's based on Saturday. So that was genuine. There's no excuse there. And he was getting treatment after the race. So he did very well to, to get a decent result in, in those conditions and temperatures. Ricardo started ahead. Norris was ill. Still, he was outperformed. So that brings us to the question again from Oscar Robledo. He says that given that Lando Norris appears to consistently have the beating of Daniel Ricciardo, even whilst unwell, when will McLaren's patience with him run out? I think sooner rather than later. Honestly, it's... It's, it's tough because there were these there, there were some decent signs at the end of last year with Ricardo and then the way he started this year I sort of thought oh actually maybe maybe he has sort of kicked on but a race weekend like this just doesn't fill me with a huge amount of confidence that Ricardo can be the driver we sort of expect him to be at McLaren and the McLaren's paying him to be at McLaren I feel like that's the main point of contention on patience. Because if, if Ricardo was just there as the number two and all the conditions of the number two and the you know the perks and benefits of the number two, then 
maybe McLaren would be okay with that. But I, st- I, st- I actually think, I, I actually think he might be a little bit short of the standard required to be even the support act to Norris. Not, not all the time. Some, some. That's the thing. Like it's just so confusing and inconsistent with him. And I really want it to go well because I, I like Ricardo. He's, a, he's such a good guy to have around in Formula One. And when he's at his, when he's really on form, he's such a good level of driver. But there's just something about this that just isn't quite working. Um, and I still haven't worked. I, I I don't really know what it is. I mean, he obviously hasn't worked out what it is. So what chance do I have? But yeah, it's it's quite quite curious. And even though we thought, it, you know, patience shouldn't really come into it based on what we were originally told by him and McLaren about a multi-year deal. And Ricardo himself said it was a three-year deal. But you sort of... Uh, you sort of ensnared Ricardo in a bit of a trap, didn't you? After un, un, unintentionally, I might add, you caught Ricardo out post race. Well, yeah, he he was asked not by me for the initial question when he was going to have some talks with McLaren about next year, and he, he said, "Oh, maybe in a few months over over the summer." And I did come back to him on that and said, "Why will you need talks?" You said last year you have a three year deal, which didn't lead to a particularly forthcoming answer. He's perfectly polite and normal Ricardo but I think I got the impression maybe he realized he'd slightly not let a cat out of the bag but maybe shown a possible direction things might be going because who knows he said there's no performance clauses but there's always there's always things and mechanisms in contracts and if McLaren are starting to think maybe it's not ever going to come together maybe they are thinking about alternatives who knows I guess it's possible that he was just a bit on autopilot and was batting away the when do you talk about next year question oh I've got a contract to sort I guess we'll talk about it in the summer without realising he does have a contract in the bag for next year because he was just an autopilot but if that was the case I feel like his response to you wouldn't have been as slightly awkward as it was yeah it felt a little bit it felt a little bit oops shouldn't perhaps have, have said that but it, it could just be a, a little slip of the tongue that doesn't mean anything but it, it was quite interesting and yeah it's it's really tough because People who listen to this podcast regularly will know, I said not so long ago, he's still got some credit in the bank, but it is running out. And I've seen Daniel Ricciardo do some great things in Formula 1. I do have confidence in him, but it is now starting to waver and I'm just wondering if something's not not quite right there. We talked about hunger with Fernando Alonso. Maybe just that hunger has gone a little bit and maybe he's trying to work through understanding that. He doesn't necessarily know it. This is, this is something that, that can be that can be difficult to understand yourself when you're in this situation. So maybe that's part of it. Maybe just the way Formula One cars are going doesn't agree with him and he can't adapt. There's all number of things. It could just be that that he goes to Monaco, suddenly everything clicks and he's fine again and he's back to what we consider to be old Ricardo. But the longer it goes on, the harder it is to see that. And yeah, I'd like to see Ricardo at his best continuing in Formula 1 for a long time, but I'm now starting to take more seriously the possibility it might not be happening. He did say after the race, Ricardo, that he hoped that they might find something wrong with the car. His pace was really poor, and he said there was just no grip. No matter what he did to adapt the driving style, it wasn't working. So there may have been something that explained the size of the gap, but even if there was something on his car that wasn't working, that still doesn't explain away the whole rest of the performance patterns. That's not a good sign. A driver saying after a race when they've been really slow that they hope that there's something wrong with the car, that's that's just never a good sign. That's clutching at straws territory, isn't it? And it's looking for an excuse, basically. Or looking, for, Obviously, that he will be legitimately hoping for an, an, an okay, authentic reason for it, but it is also a little bit of, I need an excuse for this, otherwise <laughs> I'm in serious trouble because this looks really bad. You ultimately you, you like you you know it is you know how bad it is and you know how bad it looks if you're having to try and find a reason for it. Like if if it needs if if the if it's that bad that it needs to be explained away by something, then it's really bad. Yeah, exactly. And it's not so much an excuse even to the watching world. It's almost to himself, so he he understands why things weren't working. So yeah, let's keep an eye on Daniel Ricardo and see how that goes. That. McLaren Ricardo match seems to be perfect, but it, it's just not it's just not come together as yet. So hmm, still time, but that clock is starting to run down. Well, while we're on the subject of McLaren, let's move on to 
Grid Rival, the fantasy motorsport game that the race has its own league in. You can take on me and Scott in it, and it's still open for sign-ups if you want to join the fun. Now, I asked for some tips from Mark Hughes last week on the podcast. He's very, very lucky that he's having connection issues, because I was going to take him to task on this, because he recommended McLaren to me, so I went for both Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo. Didn't really pay off. I scored just 803 points in total so this is pretty poor for my uh my team how did you get on scott i can't have beaten you on that total can i no you didn't um i had my best um best event since the season opener in in bahrain still some way short of that total which was the only time this season i've scored more than a thousand points but this was 922 um my double has gambit obviously backfired because their races imploded um, but I had Alonso who burned from the stern. I had Bottas as my talent driver, so so he did the business for me. I had Leclerc, which obviously didn't go very well, but I also had Red Bull with the one-two finish. So yeah, I had enough elements to I had enough elements to have a, a really decent week. I'm up to about 330th or something in our in our league. Um still not particularly good. Not quite as good as I've done in Fantasy Premier League, having clinched our uh, mini league for the third season in a row but I'm, I'm getting there with grid rival I feel like I feel like I'm the Mercedes of grid rival at the moment my season starts here yeah I think so far I've more been the Alpine of grid rival I've got potential but just not fulfilling it I'm bouncing around the mid pack but I'm hoping to do a bit better I now know not to listen to Mark Hughes so we'll move on to Monaco hopefully do a little bit better the Racist League does have a new leader after Barcelona Henry M who currently has a team of Perez, Schumacher, Sainz, Russell, Alonso and Red Bull with a massive 6,181 points and it will come as no surprise to anyone that this score is miles ahead of me and Scott we'll keep tracking the progress of the league over the year so download the grid rival app or visit the website so you can join in the link is in the episode description for this podcast let's move on to aston martin the big controversy of the weekend scott the biggest upgrade visually of any car was on the aston martin amr 22 the vast majority of aero parts outside of the front wing changed in some way and there were some mechanical changes as well but the side pods bore a striking resemblance to the red bull rb18 something that the red bull team has taken a keen interest in so christian horner and helmet marco have put out a little bit of innuendo on what they think might have happened IP-wise. No emphatic accusations, but it's pretty clear what they're suspecting. Aston Martin, of course, are adamant all is well and fine. And the FIA has also said it's it's fine. So where exactly are we with this dispute now? Uh, we're at the point where Red Bull is going to conduct an internal investigation to check to see whether, to use Christian Horner's words, any criminal offence has taken place with the employees who have left red bull to join aston martin in recent months as you say very much it's all very much sort of implications from these people at the moment there's no outright accusation which is because it's a very 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 serious claim um and we should stress that aston martin insists that there's been no data transfer they've not taken information from any team or dry or, or person or anything like that red bull obviously want to go through their own Security protocols, uh, checking their their software to see if anything's been downloaded or, I guess, taken off their servers or, or that sort of thing. And only if they find anything, with the suggestion being that if they did, then it would obviously massively, massively change the situation and reopen the FIA's investigation and just bring the matter front and centre again because while Aston Martin considers this the end of the matter with the FIA investigating it and releasing a statement validating and legitimising not only the upgrades but the process Aston Martin used to come to those upgrades um, if there is any wrongdoing IP breaches or what whatever it, it may be then they will have to look at it again and so the onus is on Red Bull at the moment Um if they don't find anything or they don't say they've found anything or they don't provide any evidence of wrongdoing, then Aston Martin's in the clear and will be will feel rightly completely validated because there's been no there's been no evidence that, that, that they've done anything illegal, which is obviously exactly what they've said is the case for since since we first saw the car or first heard from the team on the the Friday. In, in Spain, they're adamant they've done nothing wrong. So it's, it's a big controversy, big controversy, but it's one that can't progress unless Red Bull do something about it, whether that's find evidence or just launch a protest. Yeah, absolutely. Something has to happen. There's kind of two levels to 
any suspected sporting regulations, legality, IP can't be used, which is the the more serious thing. But also there are restrictions on on copying. You can take inspiration, but it has to be all your own work. But this is all a little bit poorly defined, so quite difficult to to pin down. But yeah, the the suggestions of any misappropriation of IP or that there's a possibility of it that needs investigating is a slightly concerning one. If anything was to come from that, it would reflect pretty badly on on Aston Martin as a company and the ownership and everything. But we'll see what happens as it stands. Nothing remotely conclusive has been said. And even what Red Bull have said is uh, is is not a direct accusation or anything. So we'll see we'll see how it goes. The one thing we'll say is yeah, the side pod package does look very 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 similar, and. It could be that this is the trend that teams are going towards. There are other teams that have got a similar concept side pod. And as Andrew Green, the, the chief technical officer, has said, Aston Martin, of course, they looked at what Red Bull were doing and others when theirs came out. But they said that this was in development some time ago before they saw the Red Bull. And the FIA has access to all sorts of data, not just the CAD data, but there's tracking of wind tunnel and CFD testing. So we, it's very easy to track down exactly when these designs or the uh, the ancestors of these designs, if you like, were being first tested. So they've already had a good look at it initially and said it's fine, which is pretty encouraging from an Aston Martin perspective. Yeah, the basic um, version of the Aston Martin defence or explanation of the, the concept is that for several months they ran two different car designs um, in tandem, basically, and then got to a point towards the end of last year where they had to commit to one of those designs to carry forward. Aston Martin went with the the spec they ultimately launched with and, and did the first five Grand Prix with because they felt that that, had a, uh, that was producing theoretically more downforce, even though it had some negative car characteristics. Um, but they realised or they felt quite early on apparently that um, that that this car would be f- w- was just too flawed and that they'd made the wrong choice. So Green's argument is that basically when they then saw the Red Bull launch with a downwashing philosophy with the side pods and other elements of the car that Aston Martin was supposedly or had supposedly been developing themselves with this other car concept they had in the works, that's when they thought, oh, maybe we really have gone in the wrong direction. So their argument is that they were all very, already very much going in that direction, I think, as you indicated, Ed. And then when they saw the Red Bull come to life, they, in public, not before, not through any illegally found CAD designs or anything like that, just purely like everybody else when the car ran in public in testing, Aston Martin saw an opportunity there to take inspiration from a design that they thought was basically similar in the fundamentals as the one that they had back in the simulators uh, in the simulations and everything back home so all they did was then by this point they'd committed to 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 bringing their version of that car which in the specific areas of the side pods clearly has taken some inspiration from the red bull but that doesn't mean it was done illegally that's broadly their argument isn't it yep and aston martin have been adamant throughout there's no problem at all mike crack the team principal speaking a few hours ago said he's not surprised there was this controversy because he was aware there were visual similarities but they're quite happy to carry on and not be distracted by it so we'll see where it goes from here it might go absolutely nowhere aston martin consider this a launch car that's basically what andy green the, the chief technical officer said it was so this was like the start of testing for them so you while you can look at the pace and say well this isn't great is it because both cars were out in q1 and neither car got into the points in the in the race but they feel that this has got much 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 more development potential than the old one they can run it lower it's not got the porpoising problem it's not smashing floor pits to pieces so this is a much much better package with a huge amount more potential in it for them to exploit so Let's see how they get on with that in the coming race so they become more familiar with it. We should briefly talk about Haas. Both drivers started in the top 10, having made Q3. First time Schumacher's been in Q3. And then we had Schumacher 14th and Kevin Magnussen 17th. So what went wrong there, Scott? I'm just trying to think of a polite way of answering the question, Ed, because the original way I was going to answer the question was I was probably going to end up swearing. <laughs> it was just a disaster, wasn't it? I mean, Gunther Steiner would probably put it that way as yeah, well, so don't worry. that's true. That's true. He'd probably approve of it in some way. Well, obviously, the Magnussen's race unraveled on, 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 on lap one. Well, I, I, do, I do think that was just his fault because um, when, you, when you watch it from both their onboards, 
there's no deviation from the Mercedes. It's the the Haas arrives on the outside and just seems to turn into the front left wheel of the Mercedes. So Magnussen's sort of the architect of his own downfall. And then Schumacher just didn't seem to have sort of any pace on on any tyre, really, because he was, what, was he sixth at the end of the first lap? So it was looking really, really good. Yeah, yeah, he ran in, he ran in six, but yeah, he was getting shuffled back a little bit uh, too quickly in the end. It just seemed like he was in free fall and it didn't matter what compound he was on. Once he was in certain positions, he was never on the attack. It was always sort of falling backwards. So And, and on a two-stopper that didn't quite work out for him in the end. Yeah, exactly. So it just felt like they didn't really get anything right today. Obviously, they were on the wrong strategy. The free stop was the quicker strategy. Um, and I don't know if Mick was just using his tyres a little bit too hard, um, but it was just one of those races where, whereas in Miami, he was always on the ascend- in the ascendancy. You know, he was always working towards getting into the top 10. If here, from very, very early on, it looked like it was going to be very difficult for him to get into the top 10. And once he was out of it, I just saw no way back in for him. Well, let's finish off with a series of the Race Members Club questions that didn't quite fit in earlier in the podcast. Scott, this one from Chris Parrott. Did any of the alternate runners in FP1 stand out? Could any of the drivers whose teams run alternates be in trouble before the season was over? Of course, we had three non-race drivers running in FP1. So which one of those excited you? I really like the look of this Robert Kubica. What do you think? This young Polish driver, I think he could go on and uh, potentially become a Grand Prix winner. Yeah, he's got a bit about him, hasn't he? I think uh, he uh, he certainly made a, a good impression. But yeah, perhaps not the ones that uh, that people are are talking about. Although knowing him, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past him finding his way back into a race seat at some point again, as he uh, as he's done pretty remarkable things to get back into F one in the in the first place. Yeah, the the reason for the flippant answer is pu- is purely because of just De Vries and Vips. They, they they can't do anything in that one hour session to make me think or oh, they've clearly got a bit about them all you can the do reason- you can impress the team a little bit in a certain way in a sort of good test driver kind of way yeah and and like De Vries seemed to De, De, De Vries seemed to endear himself with Williams in that he he was given Albon's program and he, and he did what was needed and it was pretty no, like, like no fuss and that they didn't have any issue with him, but there there were a couple of issues in his session. Like he didn't like he didn't have a switch in the right position when he needed to, and he didn't position the car very well at one point in terms of giving himself space to the to the car in front. And these are like you have to do all the basics right, and you the way you impress is by basically not trying to impress and just doing a completely like nothing job basically like you don't do anything that stands out because if you do something that stands out you've probably done something wrong um and De Vries just sort of had like he, he's he seemed pretty quick and he seemed quite comfortable and he seemed quite confident and he did everything they asked him to do he just did a couple of things a little bit sloppily and Vips was just on a do a bunch of tire work for us development run basically in, in FP1 and did did he do? I think he did a fast lap where he was quick in the first two sectors and then bailed out at the end, I think, or something like that. So, but they're not going to know anything. We're not going to see anything from Vips in a Red Bull one in in FP one that you don't already know about him, which is that he's probably quite an effective development driver, but he's just a bit too limited, and he's probably not going to get into Formula One as we then went on to see later in the F two weekend when he spun out of the race all by himself. So I just I'd be. To be completely honest, um, I don't really think the Formula 2 crop this year is that great. I think it's a weaker F2 field than we saw last year and probably the last few years. And De Vries was a champion in what his third or fourth F2 season from what was also a reduced quality field. And obviously he's done a brilliant job to go on and become Formula 3 world champion and he seems to be doing a good job in sports cars as well. He's carving out a very, very nice career for himself, and he is a good driver. Would it be good to see him in Formula One? I think he, I think he's done enough to deserve a chance. Is he someone who I think like is an Oscar Piastri, where it'd be criminal if he didn't get to Formula One? I don't think he's he's quite there. So these were these were a batch of FP1 debutants that I really, really wasn't that excited about. 
Yeah, I asked Reese about that switch thing. He had set it and did think he had, but it's one of those rotary switches and it wasn't quite slotted incorrectly, so he admitted he was a bit imprecise with it there. We should know that the reason we saw a couple of these drivers was there's a rule this year that states each team has to run a, a young F1 driver defined as having started no more than two Grand Prix to, on two occasions during the season, once in each car. So this is the first time we've seen this with Vips at Red Bull and De Vries and at Williams. Although, actually, Joe Guan Yu did qualify for that at Alfa Romeo for the first race of the season. But because it's got to be in each car, Alfa Romeo will have to do it with someone else later in the season. They can't just say Joe in the first two races or <laughs> or whatever. We're expecting to see Teo Pacher turn up later in the season in Alfa Romeo. So we'll see plenty more of these Friday drivers turning up. Kubica, incidentally, doesn't qualify as one of those drivers because he has started rather a large number of Grand Prix. Next question from Oscar Robledo. Does this race vindicate the new car design as this was one of the best dry races I can remember at this circuit? I'm going to have a crack at that one and say... I think it was a bit of an improvement. Some of it was circumstantial with the way the tyres were working and the fact you had a few cars out of position through going off. And it, I think it was made more interesting by some of that mixing up. But Barcelona is not a great place for overtaking. We did see a reasonable amount. So I, I think it's kind of a, let's say, a gentle vindication, a bit like the whole season really is a gentle vindication of, of these regs improving the raceability. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, I, I agree with your point that it's circumstantial, but I think people often lose sight of the fact that most most really good Grand Prix are circumstantial. Ultimately, just the way Formula One is, if it's a normal race, you are not going to see multiple cars scrapping it out and a, a fantastic fight from start to finish with loads of swapping of positions. Um, a good Grand Prix with no extra variables is basically a tense finish isn't it like the final stint builds towards a nice crescendo where you might have a battle in the first stint then it's very very close throughout the rest of the race and then it gets really spicy towards the end that that's a that's a good grand prix that's a that's a good race a race like this isn't really a you know leclerc was going to win this race probably quite comfortably and then if verstappen hadn't got stuck he'd have won this race quite comfortably after that so it's only because we had different things going on, like a little bit of wind disruption, putting a couple of cars in the gravel, Leclerc, the race leader, suffering an engine failure, Russell being marginally out of position in terms of getting ahead of Verstappen and then being able to hold him off because Verstappen had an intermittently failing DRS. So, yeah, I, I think I do think the 2022 cars are an improvement, absolutely. I think we probably would have seen a worse Spanish Grand Prix if we had last year's cars transposed onto this year's circumstances but i don't think it's like transformative to the point where these cars are just you know superb racing machines whatever track we go to yeah well the laws of physics still apply don't they and yeah that's why i just said a gentle vindication i think there is a general improvement which is positive but i don't think it's absolutely brilliant and also it doesn't necessarily need to be because this is a certain kind of racing and there is the fundamental thing that if you line up all the cars in their pace order and they don't get shuffled around you don't necessarily have the variables to create the uh the racing so good spanish grand prix certainly and the new rules did play a part in that the final question scott from asaf from israel who says i've joined the races members club literally just to ask this question So this is going to be an important one, I think. Recently, I've heard Ed and Scott during the podcast use the phrase, he didn't like it, but he had to go along with it in regards to various topics. And I was wondering whether they were referencing Peter O'Hanrahan Hanrahan from the day to day. I really hope so. What do you have to say for that, Scott? I can't, I can't, I I can't deny it. Yeah, he's absolutely right. I'm so, uh, you told me about this question before we started recording and I was so happy when I saw it. I was so happy that someone's picked up on it. I think a few people have actually now in total. Um, it is uh, it is, it is a nod to Peter Hammer Hammerhan. Um, I have to admit though, once or twice, I've done it completely by accident. His jokes on... The, the, his scenes on the day-to-day are some of my favourite on television. And... Uh, that particular thing is something that I've ended up sort of accidentally working into my almost everyday lexicon. So now 
I've used it once or twice in like when it comes when we've been on the podcast referring to quite serious situations because it's basically become now like a glorified extended synonym for well you know it's just it is what it is he he obviously he obviously doesn't agree with that situation but he's just had to accept it but instead of using those words just say he didn't like it but he had to go along with it and I I regret it every now and again because I kind of think, oh, I might have slightly belittled that situation. But um, no, it is. Uh, I, I, I'm glad that someone has noticed it and it entertained. And it just goes to show that really we just have to have such a broad range of things we talk about on this podcast because you just never know what's going to entice someone to the race members club. So maybe, you know, in the future, it will be someone picking up an Alan Partridge reference or something from the TV show community or something like that. We can we can but hope, you know, would that this podcast were a time podcast. Exactly. There's uh, there's plenty of those little references that turn out there. They're almost by accident sometimes. Now, I imagine many of you, particularly international listeners, not from the UK, we're wondering what on earth we're talking about. But the, the day today was a, a new satire program from 1994. Excellently done, put together by, uh, by the brilliant Chris Morris. But if you go on to YouTube and search for the day-to-day and Peter, you will find some clips of Peter O'Han, 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 and you might find him saying, I don't like it, but I'll have to go along with it, and the German equivalent of that somewhere to understand what on earth we're talking about. But uh, yeah. Nicked and licked and... Exactly, exactly. It's just something that's that's slipped accidentally into our uh, into our vocabulary, but thanks for... I think that's what Mick Schumacher said after the Grand Prix today about his uh, slide down the order. Yeah, well, he had no choice but to go along with it. That's uh, that's the nature of slides down the order. But I'm pleased we've been able to answer that particular question, and thanks for noticing. So, as always, thanks to Mark and Scott for your insight. Mark, unfortunately, a little bit of a bit. Yeah, thanks, Mark. You've been a brilliant, brilliant colleague over the second half of this podcast. You've 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 really pulled your weight on this one. He did try very, very hard, and unfortunately, just we are in different hotels, but in different hotels at a reasonable distance from each other, so that precluded us uh, getting together to to continue it. But head to the race dot com as there's loads to read there. Don't forget the hyphen, of course, if you're going there, including Mark Hughes' race analysis, which I'm sure you'll be able to send despite the internet being a bit iffy check out the race's other podcasts covering indycar formula e and moto gp among others and if video is your thing head to our youtube channel the races keep coming thick and fast with another this coming weekend so stay with us for everything you need to know about the monaco grand prix (laughs) 